In today's show, you're doing the thing that I am training my clients to do all the time. It's like, hey, your job is not to take out the trash and make all the sales and do all the coding and to handle all the phone calls. You're, while you can do any of that, you're not above doing it. Your job really is to set the vision, communicate the vision, build the asset. It sounds like that's what you're doing every day. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, exactly. And, and I always tell people, I'm just too dumb to stop trying to figure stuff out. So eventually I learn what I'm doing. And, and that's exactly what, what it is for me. It's I have to be able to think and set the vision and be at the, the high level. And if I'm not, if I'm in the business, I get bogged down. The business doesn't become innovative and we st get stagnant as a result. And, and so I think that's really important to learn and understand and figure out is the business shouldn't depend on you as the catalyst for it growing. It should depend on you as the catalyst for it to be innovative. In today's ultra competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Welcome back to the show. I am the real Jason Duncan. Today's guest is Chandler Walker. And he started his entrepreneurial journey after graduating from the University of Nevada, Reno, with a degree in biochemistry. And uh, he was wanting to be a doctor. That's kind of what he wanted. He's going to talk about on the show today how growing up with a mom who's bipolar kind of influenced him to head down the medical pathway. However, he's going to share how he got disenfranchised with that and decided, you know what, I'm going to open up my own health practice, not as an MD, but as a health practice to really help people in a way that he couldn't do necessarily as a doctor. And so he set up this brick and mortar business. Then he goes on to set up an online uh, health practice. And he's going to share how that story developed over time. And then also what's interesting about Chandler's story is that he, uh, he, he kind of revamped the whole sales model. Um, he saw what he didn't like in the sales process and decided, you know, he's going to turn it into a more psychotherapeutic sales process, which is interesting because I don't think anybody else is doing this. And he's got something he's created called Compassion Conversations. And we're going to talk about how he takes people through Compassion Conversations rather than just sales pitches and how it's doubled and even tripled his close rate. And even people who don't buy now will end up buying later because of the relationship and the compassion that was demonstrated throughout the process. He's taught over 3,000 people his system of compassion conversations, and he has a goal to change the whole sales landscape related back to this idea of being compassionate, having psychotherapeutic conversations rather than just sales pitches. He also invests regularly in the crypto market, and he bought Ethereum when it was 15 bucks and got a 20,000% increase, turning $250 into $50,000. And uh, I joked with him pre-show that the greatest regret of his life is he didn't put $250,000 in <laughs> at the time. But anyway, thank you for listening today and help me welcome Chandler Walker to the show. Chandler, thanks so much for being on the show, man. I'm really glad that you're here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. Super excited to be here to really talk about sales and manipulation and how it drove me crazy and how it turned something that I was doing upside down and I changed the whole game. Well, it's uh, we're definitely going to dig into that for sure because uh, you and I both do sales training. That's part of. I'm not. A, I don't consider myself a sales trainer, but it is part of the services I provide for my clients. I've actually got one client that all I do is train their sales team. I don't work with the. Uh, I don't work with the owner at all, which is not normal. But I train their sales team. So you and I both do that, and uh, you and I probably have very similar, <laughs> similar perspectives on all the crap that the '80s and '90s sales techniques are still kind of bleeding into today that are like, we, we can get into that for sure. But since this show is about entrepreneurs and it's about how they became successful, how did you get your start Chandler as an entrepreneur? I mean, was it as a kid, were you doing things as a kid that just kind of developed into entrepreneurship or 
did it happen later in life for you? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it started in two domains. And, and the first one was when I was a kid. And I had I grew up with a mother who suffered from bipolar disorder. And so I had to learn how to communicate with her in a, sort of a neutral way. Sometimes she'd have highs and lows. And I learned that if I could communicate neutrally, I could move her up, pull her off the cliff. And I think a lot of times kids growing up build animosity towards their parents and grow to dislike them or hate them because of, of that. But the good news is I didn't. And that led me to a med school pathway because we didn't really figure out there was anything going on with her or wrong with her until my 20s. Because back then, if something was wrong mentally, people would say, just smile, put your head up and everything will be fine. We promise there's nothing wrong with you. But in reality, there was. So she didn't get help until my 20s. And that's really what led me to want to be on this med school pathway. I wanted to be able to change the landscape of, of medicine and, and help people and ultimately be someone who could spot something like what my mother suffered from and be the catalyst for change. Uh, but the problem was I got disenfranchised in that system as I was going through. And that's like where the next phase of my journey started. So you were going to go into a medical career. So you went to the Reno, uh, University of Nevada, Reno, got a degree in biochemistry, and you were fully anticipated going into that. So that really is not an entrepreneurial thing. Although I guess some some doctors are entrepreneurial, but I think most aren't. They they are business owners for sure, but they're not entrepreneurs, which is a different. There's a difference. So when did when did that shift? Was it just the disenfranchisement with the system that decided, hey, I got to do something different? Was that what it was? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And like you're saying, in medical school, doctors, you're not an entrepreneur at all. You don't know how to run a business or how to do anything. Because what I did next was I broke off from that. I got tired of, I felt like as I was precepting down at University of Medical Center in Vegas, I felt like what I was doing was providing medication to people. And I really didn't like that concept. And it's not a shot at doctors, it's a system. We have a, a sick care system and you provide medication so people can get better. But I wanted to do more and provide a holistic solution and be able to provide just the idea of six areas of wellness. And so I broke off from the medical pathway and that's when I opened up our brick and mortar. And like you were saying, medical school and university didn't teach me how to do this. So I was just a young, dumb kid right out of college, basically who opened up a business. And uh, the good news was I had a dad who was an entrepreneur my whole life. He had a siding and windows and a contractor business. And so he would take me every morning in the summers to his job sites and we would, I would look at, watch him talk to customers and talk to all the people and work. And one summer he made me work. And I realized at that moment, I was never going to do that in my life, <laughs> but it also gave me the strength to say, okay, you know what, maybe I can do this. He did this for a long time and, and maybe he can guide me a little bit. So dad was an entrepreneur influenced that. And that's why you decided not to necessarily go the medical pathway as a doctor, but you did open a clinic, right? You opened it on, or was it online? Which one did you do? Was it brick and mortar or online? Yeah, we opened up a brick and mortar. So we opened up a brick and mortar we called Stone Age Fuel, and it was centered around six areas of wellness. So it was mental health, social health, sleep, nutrition, fitness, and ultimately habits. Uh, and what happened was we opened the brick and mortar and I had no idea what I was doing. So the first year I basically got up at four in the morning and I'd go to bed somewhere around midnight. Because with a brick and mortar, you not only have to manage the facility and manage the staff, but you also have to clean the toilets and you also have to make sure the lights stay on. So there's a lot of responsibility associated with that. And at that time, I really didn't understand systems or how to replace myself. It was just go in head first, basically blind and suck it up and enjoy your life, maybe. So you open the online or excuse me, the brick and mortar and then uh, I think your story is about well, when COVID starts hitting, you're like, uh oh, can't do this anymore. So what? How did COVID affect what you were doing as a business owner and entrepreneur? Yeah, good question. So in 2013, we opened the brick and mortar, and then in 2014, I started to decide, hey, maybe we should have an online presence. I think we could have a global footprint here. We have something pretty cool. So I built up the first phase of it, which was just basically spreadsheets and kind of half working online. And then 2015, 2016, we got to the point where we started to build a curriculum out. In 2017, I actually had an app that we started building out. And I had a, a friend that I started meeting that was a doctor in clinical psychology. And she really helped me revamp and amp up our whole curriculum centered around cognitive behavior therapy and acceptance commitment therapy and motivational interviewing. Uh, and so then that led to right before COVID, we had a fully functional online program running that I had a few years to build up. And so oh, okay. just before COVID hit, I was able to 
and it sounds like I did this on purpose, but I was able to sell the brick and mortar and move on and go all in on the online. So when COVID hit, we weren't like everyone else panicking, trying to pivot shift and get an online thing. We already had it going. So that's a blessing because you didn't know what was coming. So you had the online thing going, you got an app going, you sold the brick and mortar. Um, where did the sales part of this come into? Because part of your stories I talked about in the intro is that you had this huge distaste for sales and you wanted to do something different. So when did that become a reality in your, in your journey? Yeah, good question. So in the beginning, I was basically Mr. Sales guy. I had to sell everybody into the brick and mortar, and then I had to sell everybody into the online. And so both realms, I had to learn how to sell. And I, I found that I was, I was okay. I was pretty good at it. But when I started getting coaching, I started getting into a slump. And the reason I think I started getting into a slump was because most of the coaches I hired were telling me, you need to go for the clothes. You need to stick them with the knife and then, then twist it a little and you keep stabbing them. And if, if they cry, they buy, just make sure they're a bag of tears. And ultimately that wasn't something that I was comfortable with, or I, I was, I liked because I felt like I was in this brick and mortar to help people, but then I was sitting here bullying and manipulating them so they could get help. I felt like I was living a lie and I was kind of clashing with myself and our product wasn't cheap. The beginning, our product was like $1,500 for three months. And in its current iteration, it's like $3,200 for, for three months. So it's not like it's a cheap product and it's a consumer-based product, not a business product. So it's learning to sell that some, something that doesn't necessarily have a financial ROI. And so what I did was I took all of the idea in our mental health curriculum, the cognitive behavior therapy, motivational interviewing, and, and all of that, and put it into my sales system and created this psychotherapeutic sales platform to be able to essentially remove my own madness. So are you, as far as you know, are you the only person to have built a sales system around, you called it uh, psychotherapeutic? As far as you know, are you the only one doing that? Uh, as far as I know, yeah. And I mean, I could toot my own horn and say, we're the only ones doing it. We might be because everyone else I see is usually focusing on like NLP as like an exclusive atmosphere, or they're just kind of bolting on the old model of sales. So I think we might be the only ones who are focusing on a psychotherapeutic pathway to sales that's psychologically driven through actual clinical psychology. So when you are, when you say psychotherapeutic sales, uh, and I know you mentioned uh, NLP, which is neural. Uh, uh, well, I just completely blanked on NLP. <laughs> help, help me with that. I just completely blanked on it. Go ahead. I've got you covered. Neuro linguistic programming. I See, I, right. I, I said the first like two <laughs> syllables and I completely blanked on the rest of it. So neuro linguistic programming is a big thing. I know a lot of people talk about that brain science going into it, uh, into that. But when you say psychotherapeutic, what does that mean? Yeah, good question. So psychotherapeutic means it's the basic basis of clinical psychology. So when you start talking about cognitive behavior therapy, it's the idea of talk therapy, of identifying what the core problem is. So you have an external statement, then you have a core belief. So we take the external statement someone gives you, I want to lose weight, but then we work to ask good strategic questions to find the internal problem. So uh, it's always associated with insecurity or something deep that someone doesn't want to talk about. Then once we figure that out, you connect the dots to the past to figure out the triggers that have been manifesting along the way that are preventing success. So it's the idea of taking talk therapy and using it as a modality to uncover what's happening and figure out the real problem at hand. So you shift someone's mindset from, I want to lose weight to, wow, I'm just, I'm embarrassed that people are looking at me. I'm embarrassed that my significant other might see me naked. And so all of a sudden this real problem manifests. And that's kind of the core belief and the core issue that you need to uncover to figure out if you can actually help someone. And more importantly, move someone to a mindset to where they actually want help. Who, who helped you figure this out? Or is this just, you know, trial and error on your own? So it was a lot of trial and error on my own through college. I was a massive nerd. And so I studied biochemistry. I got into microbiology, uh, immunology, and then psychology became a pretty big aspect of what I was doing. But at the same time, as I was building this curriculum out, I met someone who's a doctor in clinical psychology and I gave her the curriculum and I said, Hey, what do you think about this? And she looked at me and said, well, I think you just created cognitive behavior therapy. So I was like, oh, that's cool. So she gave me about 17 books to read. I read every single one of them front to back. And I recognize a lot of the communication patterns that I developed as a kid working with my mother were these patterns. And so I guess I inadvertently accidentally created my system through my own defensive mechanisms as a kid. 
how did you see or did you see an improvement in the sales closing right which is the point of sales is to close you could get the customer to buy something you provide value they they give you money for it did you see a uh, a significant increase in your ability to close by using this type of sales methodology yeah and I, I used to document this so my close rates when i would try an old methodology or work with other coaches was significantly lower. And this usually was about two to three times higher. So my close rate would be at the minimum double. But what's more interesting to me was long-term people would come back. So if someone didn't buy, they would come back a few weeks later, they would come back a month later. And I built this pipeline that had a snowball impact. So because I was creating such an impactful experience with people on the first phone call or the first chat, they were comfortable coming back and they were excited to come back because we detached from the need to sell that day and moved into the idea that we're going to build the relationship long-term. Use the word detached. And I, that's one of the characteristics of uh, one of the things I teach in sales to my people. And it sounds like that's what you, uh, you probably agree with too, this idea of being detached from the outcome, but rather attached to the process. So you're in charge of the process as the salesperson, you want to take the person through the process, but you're detached in a healthy way from what's going to happen at the end. And, and I found, and I wonder if you think you found the same thing is that when you're detached like that from the outcome, you, you do a more authentic process and you're actually looking to build value and to build relationship, not just to make the sale, but to build a good relationship that provides value long-term. What, what do you think about that term detachment in sales? Yeah, I 100% agree. And the reason behind that is when you think about the dynamics of humans, if I'm seething, if I have commission breath, what can I do to get you to buy today? You're not going to want to buy because you're going to want to run away because now I have to chase you. But if I come into the conversation detached, if I don't need the sale, if I don't care about the sale, the person's going to be more intrigued and want to be involved with what you're doing because they don't feel like you're just there to sell them. And it also allows you to move into a dynamic to where you ask questions with a purpose, provide strategic intent, understand those triggers. And you can really work to help the other person understand the real problem at hand. And typically what we find is these people don't know that that problem exists. If someone's trying to get lead, they say, Hey, I want to get leads, but the real problem is I'm going to be homeless and my kids aren't going to have a house. Well, now you uncovered the real issue that's happening and they're going to feel really comfortable with you when they finally say that, because chances are they won't tell anybody that that's hidden deep inside. Yeah. Well, so is that, is, did you create a company called Compassion Conversations? Is that now the company or is that a product of what you're just doing? Tell me about that. Yeah. So the whole company we call, I call culture of care now because we're here to build a culture of care. So we have Stone Age Fuel, the health brand. We have Compassion Conversations, which is the the sales brand. And so I have two brands under that umbrella. Well, three brands now with our wealth aspect, but that's one of the brands underneath our culture of care umbrella. So it's, I'm, I'm making notes here. So, so Stone Age Fuel and you got Compassion Conversations and you said that, that the overall, the, the kind of the high level is called what? Culture of care. Culture of care. All right. That's good. I, I like that. I like the imagery that that provides. Now, are you still doing the online health, uh, the online health practice? Yeah, for sure. I'm the kind of guy who I, I'm, I'm a good entrepreneur and in being innovative and creating new products. And I'm also really good at installing people to manage and run the businesses. So here's, here's, here's a real interesting thing. My significant other actually continues to run the, the Stone Age Fuel brand, the health and wellness brand. We ran it together. So her and I haven't killed each other yet, which is huh. amazing. And she is essentially operations. She manages that brand. I kind of oversee everything and then I'll install people to be the, the managers or to be the technicians in each thing. So that way, my philosophy is if I build something, I'm either going to sell it or I'm going to have other people manage it because I don't want to just buy myself a job and be stuck inside of it. Well, I think my listeners will know that that uh, will know that all too well, because that's my thing. Exit without exiting. How do you establish your business and you can exit the daily operations without necessarily selling it? How do you establish systems and processes so that uh, or invest in people so that the business can continue to run, be profitable, provide you money and income, and you're free as an entrepreneur to do what you want rather than having to do what you have to do what, what about being a job owner rather than a business owner. When did that, because I want to, I want to dig into that a little bit, because since it happens to be the thing I talk about all the time, that's kind of the central message of my brand. What, when did that occur to you? Cause you started, you said you started this back in 2013 or 14. So when did it occur to you? 
wait a minute, I don't want to do this every day. I need to get people doing this and systems doing it. When, when did that occur to you? Yeah, good question. So that kind of occurred to me the first year in business in 2013, because what happened was I was basically only outside in the nighttime. And my little sister looked at me. She was really young at the time, maybe seven or eight. And she said, Chandler, I think you're a vampire. I was like, <laughs> what do you mean? I only see you out in the night. And I was like, mother of God, I have a problem. I need to fix this. I need to get out of this business and, and learn how to run this thing and not be stuck inside of it. It, it was terrible because that first year, we would get there at 4 a.m. I would have a break around nine. So I would take a little nap from like nine to 10. And then a, a customer might walk in and I'm like bolting out the door. I, I swear to God, I wasn't sleeping. It was, it was a disaster. So after that first year, I kind of looked at the, the tenets of business. And when I look at things, it's often in, in the scientific method. So how can I create a hypothesis? How can I test it? And how can I see if it works? So then I just started looking at what the profitability was, what products were the most profitable, what systems that I need to organize to remove myself, what people can I put into play? And, and that's kind of where it all began. So you, you're smarter than the average bear because, as, as I know firsthand from being a coach for business owners who are trapped in their businesses, most people don't realize it as early as you did. I mean, most people don't realize it that first year, but I think your little sister was a big influence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> are you a vampire? Let me see your teeth. What are, you, yeah. what are you doing there, man? So, okay, that's a very, very uh, interesting story. So now as an entrepreneur, uh, uh, you're, you're very successful. Things are going well for you. You've got the online, you've got the culture of care with all the different brands. You've got people running these businesses. So what do you do with your time mostly? Like what, what's the thing that, uh, that, that takes up most of your daily attention? I think the thing that takes up most of the attention, I'll still have meetings with like my higher level managers. And so that probably takes the most attention. And the other side of things is what I call thinking time. So I take a lot of time out of my day to look at what we're doing inside each of our businesses and try to ask myself, how could I, how could I essentially replace the whole business? How could I essentially be the new business who comes in town and makes this one bankrupt. And so I think a lot of my time is devoted to thinking about how I can adjust what we're doing and how I can move what we're doing. So that way we're continuously on the forefront of, of where people are, of what people are looking for, and ultimately how things are flowing. And it doesn't necessarily lead to adjusting the core product, but it adjusts it leads to making the core product either better, faster for people to get through, or somehow figuring out how to make it more clear and concise. Yeah. So it sounds like to me, you're following uh, the law of the architect to a T, whether or not you, you know it. It's you know the architect of the business, the founder of the business, his or her job is to set the vision, communicate the vision, and build the asset. That's it. That's your, that's your three-pronged job as the architect, the founder of the business. And you, Chandler, it sounds like you have stumbled upon that. I mean, I don't mean like dumb, dumb luck, but like you're doing the thing that I'm training my clients to do all the time. It's like, Hey, your job is not to take out the trash and make all the sales and do all the coding and to handle all the phone calls. You're while you can do any of that. You're not above doing it. Your job really is to set the vision, communicate the vision, build the asset. It sounds like that's what you're doing every day. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, exactly. And, and I always tell people, I'm just too dumb to stop trying to figure stuff out. So eventually I learn what I'm doing. And, and that's exactly what, what it is for me. It's I have to be able to think and set the vision and be at the, the high level. And if I'm not, if I'm in the business, I get bogged down. The business doesn't become innovative and we st get stagnant as a result. And, and so I think that's really important to learn and understand and figure out is the business shouldn't depend on you as the catalyst for it growing. It should depend on you as the catalyst for it to be innovative. That's a good, that's a good perspective. And that's probably a good quote that my editors need to pull out and we can do that on social media because that was good. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. <of> Dro <laughs> mic, mic drop. I had a sound effect. And I'm play. out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're going to take a break from our show right now to bring you our sponsors. All right. Thanks for listening to our sponsors. Now back to the show. Well, so Chandler, what do you, uh, what is your definition of success? I mean, this is the root of all success after all. So how do you define that term? Yeah, at this point in my life, my def definition of success is the fact that I get to spend a, an obscene amount of time with my three-year-old daughter. I always grew up with parents who were working hard. My mom worked, she drove two hours a day to get to work, two hours to come home. So she was she worked herself to the bone and she took really good care of us, but we didn't get to see her as much because of that. And so as a father now, my goal having a child was I need to be there for her 
more than any other father should be or can be because I'm the only guy who's sitting there. I go to every dance practice. We go, I'm at all the recitals. Last time she was a ball, a, a bag of tears on stage. Cause she had stage fright at two and a half or three. And I'm up there with like happy pills and happy pills are smarties. And so all the little girls are coming at me. Can I have some happy pills? I'm like, great. I'm like a drug dealer back here with all the uh, three-year-old kids. Uh, but that's, that's what success is for me. We can go, I can take her on vacations. We've been to Hawaii like three times this year, or I don't know how many, but I, I can wake up late and have breakfast with her. I can shut down what I'm doing and go eat pancakes. And I think it's just, it's really cool to be in that position to where I can make her my priority and I don't have to make a job or, or work my priority necessarily. And, and ultimately for me, that's success to have that little person look at me every day and recognize that daddy gets to be there for her and daddy gets to actually be part of her life and not just work and come home. What's her name? Aubriana. Aubriana. What a beautiful name. Well, Aubriana, at some point, you're not old enough now to listen to podcasts to know what this is about. But when you get old enough to listen back to this episode of The Root of All Success with your dad on there, I want you to know that he loved you very much. And he's he's designing his life to make sure that he pays attention to you. And that that is success. And so I want to speak directly to the listeners. We're talking with Chandler Walker, and he had just gave his definition of success, which is about spending time spending obscene, he used the word obscene obscene time with his daughter and that isn't that what we want i mean chandler it's amazing to me how so many entrepreneurs spend all their time in their business and they think that some point in the future they'll get money as a result of spending the time and that's backwards don't spend time to get money spend money to get time I, what do you think about that yeah 100 percent. I, I look at it this way money's going to come and go i can make money it's, it's not that hard to make money but what is challenging is time I can either spend it working on my business, I can spend it on myself, I can spend it with my family. But at the end of the day, that time, that's the one thing that I'm never going to get back. And so I look at the rest of my life. Am I going to look back and say, I wish I would have worked more? I wish I would have made more money. Or am I going to look back and say, wow, I wish I would have spent more time with that little girl when I had it because now it's gone and it's gone forever. I love it. I love your heart about that too, man. I, I'm, I'm the same way. My kids were much older when I started, when I became an entrepreneur, but I, I think I teach all the time and I talk about this all the time that time is a non-renewable resource and money is a renewable resource. You can get, like you said, you can get more money. If you spend money, yeah, I've lost money, but I always get it back. I can get that back, but lost time is done. You can't, you can't get any more. My kids are, as of the recording date are 21 and 19 and you know, I started my com my first company 12 years ago. So they they weren't three years old when I was dealing with this. I was in the corporate world at the time. So I, I applaud you for getting your priorities right, making sure that your life is designed and built around what's most important to you and that's spending time with your daughter. And I know that the dividends that's going to pay long term are going to be unimaginable to you now. And later, it's just going to be amazing. Um, I, I would like to, if I could, at this point in our conversation, I want to shift just a little bit. And I want to talk about this theory that I have. So I'm going to I'm going to do a little bit more talking at this moment in the show than I normally do. But I want to kind of set this up and then I'm going to kind of turn it back over to you to answer some questions. But I've got this theory and I know you you and I don't know each other. We were introduced um, through through an organization that uh, that said, hey, these guys need to get together and do a podcast together. And I'm very grateful that they did. So you don't really know me, but I, but there's this theory that I've got. Uh, after interviewing hundreds of entrepreneurs about their success, how they became successful, that there are these five keys that happen throughout every single one of their stories, whether you're in aviation, you're in biochemistry, you're in healthcare, you're in sales, whatever it is, that entrepreneurs who are successful use these five keys to unlock the door of success. And what I want to do is if you're okay with it, and we'll kind of go through these, I'll, I'll tell you what each of them is. And then I want you to think about, yeah, that okay, I use that key to unlock success. And here's what it looked like for me. Or if you disagree, if you think there's that doesn't apply to you, feel free to disagree. So the first of those five keys is that of passion, like passion unlocks success probably more than anything else. And and most people think Chandler when I say passion, they think well you got to like it, you got to have an emotional attachment to it, and that's not necessarily what I mean because passion doesn't technically that's not really what it means. Passion actually means willing to suffer. So when you think about like the passion of the Christ, we talk about the passion of the Christ that time his last week on earth. 
I always wondered why do we call it that? It didn't look like he was excited, <laughs> but it was it was what he was willing to endure. He was willing to suffer for a greater cause. And so what I found, and I want to see what you think about this and how it how it played into your story, is that most entrepreneurs who have successful, actually every entrepreneur I've ever talked to, had passion for the thing that they were building. They were willing to suffer or endure to build the thing that led them to success. So first of all, two two part question. Number one, do you agree with that? And second of all, how did passion play a part? if at all, in your story of success? Yeah, good question. I 100% agree with that because when I look at the way I started the business, no other human would have worked from like three or four in the morning until midnight. And I did it for a year straight, slept in the back of the business. And honestly, I never once thought about quitting or, or throwing in a towel. I just thought about how can I make this better? How can I save time? How can I get out of this? Maybe I was even lazy and didn't want to work so much. So I started pulling myself out. But it took that kind of struggle and that kind of suffering to be able to get there. Same thing with building the sales program. I wasn't happy with how sales was taught. And I did like 4,000 sales conversations by myself before I'd let anyone touch it as I was building out the system. Was that fun? No, that's 4,000 hours probably of sales by itself. And, and so I figured from this question along the way, I've suffered quite a bit and I've put in a lot of the idea of passion to make these things work. And, and I think that's part, and, and that's a huge indicator of success. How do you see that? Do you see that as something that's a, a, a failure and miserable and you want to quit? Or do you see that as something that continues to drive you forward and gives you that, that strength and desire to want to move on? Well, the second key to that I found in uh, entrepreneurs' ability to unlock success is being at the right place at the right time. And so I, I've always found that people, that entrepreneurs, that they can point to place and time, like maybe specific. I was at this building or at this meeting, but but others say, well, you know, if I hadn't been born in this state at the, in this era, you know, in the 2020s or whatever, or if I, not born, but if I wasn't present in that time, it wouldn't have happened. So is there a place and time for you that you can point to? Yeah, man, this was one of the keys to me being who I am today. Yeah, I think it's sort of a try, almost a triangle. It's like I grew up with mom with bipolar, led me to med school. I grew up with dad, entrepreneur, led me to breaking off and be comfortable to being able to open the brick and mortar. So I, I think those three, those two dynamics, mom and dad, which led me to med school and breaking off, ultimately was the reason I was able to get on this journey and, and have to and need to figure this out. Yeah. And that's kind of, that actually plays right into the third key, which is knowing the right people. And I was going to actually made a note when you talked about your dad being an entrepreneur uh, and, and, and also your, your sister for saying, are you a vampire? <laughs> you know, exactly. those two, those two people, it sounds in just the story, the version of the story you told me sound like they were the people that had, they not been in your life. You and I probably wouldn't be doing this show today. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Because I wouldn't have had the confidence to be able to say, hey, maybe I can run a business. And then I wouldn't have had this little person tell me I'm a vampire, which is a self-realization moment for me. And I find I, I tend to listen to the words people say, which is shocking, I, I know. But when I listen to people, I reflect on what they say, even if it's a criticism, even if it's something that's just thrown as a something saying something at eight years old, I, I tend to listen to those things and, and really get feedback on myself. Like, does that make sense? Is that me? And that's kind of an, a, a technique called examine the evidence in, in clinical psychology. So you've got the passion, the right place, right time, and you've got the right people in your life, knowing the right people. The fourth key is that of preparation. In other words, having the know-how to pull it off. So, so not everybody can start an online health practice. Not everybody can open an online or even a brick and mortar health health. Like I couldn't do that. That's not, I don't, I'm not prepared for that. I'm not ready. It sounds to me like your one of your keys to success is the preparation you had by a mom who was bipolar and you had to deal with the mental strain of what that was and understanding and the motivation that that put behind you to do it. Going to uh, med school, you know, getting that biochemistry degree or going to get, going to school and get the biochemistry degree. That to me, that sounds like that's what's prepared you for that part of your life of success. And then also understanding that you didn't like the sales tactics also prepared you to be successful. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's totally true. All of that prepared me to be able to do what I do. The communication I had with my mother led me to be able to create the communication platform and pathway for the mental health side of our curriculum. It led me to be able to create the curriculum from what I learned to do. 
And ultimately it allowed me to bolt on those six pillars. And that same communication strategy and pattern led me to be able to communicate in my sales program and create that compassion conversations atmosphere. So I think all of that preparation moved me into a place to where it seemed and appeared that I could communicate really well and that I was just lucky with the gift of gab. But in reality, it was like a lifetime of learning to be able to figure that out. So the fifth, the fifth key that I found is that of a plan. And we haven't really talked about this yet in your, in your story. So I'm interested to know if it actually played a part in your journey to success and plan by me, by, by plan, I don't mean written business plan, because I found that most entrepreneurs who are very successful didn't have one. So that's not what I mean. What I mean by plan is um, having the financial or other resources required in order to be successful. So for example, uh, I, I don't know this to be true, but when you opened a brick and mortar, that first thing, there had to be some sort of plan. Well, how do I, you know, how do I negotiate the lease? How do I sign for it? How do I, how do I pay for it? Cause I, you know, I'm pre-revenue. How do I do that? Do you, do you, can you look back and go, yeah, my plan was this, even though I didn't know it at the time, <laughs> this was my plan to make it happen. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm the kind of person who, Set, who plans everything. And then my significant other, good thing she's around. She's very good at operations and making th- sure like things stick and put into place. So we work well together, but opening the brick and mortar, I spent like 900 hours learning how to negotiate a lease. I learned how to set up our, our membership structure, create the systems and, and strategy. So we could fill the place up when we opened the doors. And that allowed us to fill the place up and, and have a full load of clientele when we open the doors. Obviously, we still work 24-7, but at least we could pay the bills. And so I think that kind of preparation and planning led me to being able to be successful in the business. Because if I hadn't learned how to negotiate the lease, sometimes you get screwed in that atmosphere. If I hadn't learned how to and researched how to fill the membership up, then we would have opened with an empty ghost town, which would have been a disaster. Yeah. Well, so there you have it. I mean, you, you're kind of you verified the theory that, that passion, place, people, preparation, and plan were part of your story of how you unlock success as an entrepreneur. But are there any other things besides those things that you look back and say, yeah, this was a key to my success? Yeah, there's one other thing that I think is really important, and, and that's my network. Because as I was grow, going up, uh, before we opened the brick and mortar, we were running seminars all over the, the country on what we call the Fluff to Tough Healthy Eating Program. And I, I met a lot of people in locally and around the country. And then as CrossFit started to get really big, I started to meet people in that domain, in that environment. And that led me to teaching some of their seminars. And so I met so many different people that if I needed something, I could call someone and have either what I needed right away or someone else to talk to. And ultimately at this point, I think the network that I created ultimately defined the net worth that I have, because now I could lose it all and still call people and and build it right back. I think we don't take enough time to build and develop strategic partnerships and make relationships with people, real relationships. And that pays back tenfold. hundred percent agree. Your network is your net worth. I say that so many times and it's so cliche because people get tired of hearing it, but you're the average of the top five that you hang out with the most. You're going to, they're either going to pull you up or pull you down. You're going to have an influence on them as much as they have an influence or, or less than they have an influence on you because there's more of them than there is you. You have an influence, but not as much as those people around you. I, I, I love what you said. And that actually plays right into the third, the third key, knowing the right people. So, exactly. so I think that it, it's exactly what we need to do. So entrepreneurs out there listening, Chandler Walker has given us the tips. We've got to make sure that we are surrounding ourselves with good people. I actually, I've got a quick story. I was, um, there's a guy that I know here in Nashville locally who is about to move to, uh, I think Portugal, he's moving to Portugal and I, we don't know each other tremendously well, but enough. And so he invited me to a kind of a get together, men's get together at a, at a local kind of speakeasy bar here in Nashville this past Monday night, just, just kind of a farewell. It's all, you know, wish him well as he goes. Well, I went, I went with a friend of mine that we both kind of have a mutual and I met some amazing people at this thing. And I could have said, you know what? I don't know this guy really well. I'm not going to go, but I met people. I've got a guy coming on my show. I've invited one of the, one of the guys to come speak at an event. I'm going to be on somebody, one of their, one of those guys podcasts. There's no telling where else it's going to go. Just because I decided to go to this thing, go to the thing, get your network, man, build it up. And Chandler, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you said the network part because Entrepreneurs who are listening need to know 
building that network is vital to your success. What other advice would you give to entrepreneurs who are listening to this show? I mean, if you think about this show has entrepreneurs on every, every piece of the spectrum, you've got brand new entrepreneurs that haven't even started yet all the way to the nine figure entrepreneurs and those are billionaires or whatever. What would you say, what's your piece of advice for any, any part of that spectrum? Who would you speak to and what advice would you give them? Yeah, I think for people across the board, I think the thing that allows you to continue pushing the boundaries is continuously pushing your and promoting your, your vision and recreating your vision. I think a lot of us get stagnant when we have the initial vision and it doesn't change because in the beginning, we get stuck inside the business and down the road, we just kind of stop thinking about it. And so I think the most important thing for the entrepreneur at almost any level is to continuously recreate your vision, to take the time out of your day. And a lot of people don't do this to have thinking time to just either sit there at the desk or stare at the wall. That's your choice. And I actually learned this from Gary Halbert, who's a really good copywriter. And he said, okay, here's how you get good at copy. You sit there and you write copy or you stare at the wall and you set a 30 minute timer. Uh, And so I started doing that with just thinking time. And then I read a book by Keith J. Cunningham called The Road Less Stupid. And he said the same thing. Hey, every day should have thinking time devoted to it. And so I started doing that. And and it's magical because I, in the beginning, maybe you stare at the wall and think about like tacos or whatever. But after a while, all of a sudden, these ideas come into your brain and you're like, this is amazing. I haven't had this amount of thinking and the capabilities to think in this domain ever. That's Fantastic. I actually, I actually think that's a, a, a huge, huge point that listeners need to tap into is the strategic thinking and planning time is should be on your calendar. It should be something you do on a regular basis. Um, you know, you, you're advocating daily. Uh, I used to have a, a built into one of my blocks on my block schedule every week. Now I actually take a full day per month and that's all I do. And it, it's, and it, it, it's fantastic because you're right. You come up with some cool stuff that you wouldn't have ever thought of otherwise yeah. because you've blocked out everything else to so turn the phone, turn the email, turn everything off. And you're just focused on thinking. And sometimes I just sit in the chair on the other side of my, de- on my room here and it's just kind of, like you said, stare off into space and you never know what's going to happen. Um, how could people get in touch with you, Chandler? If they, they're really uh, kind of, they like your message and they say, hey, I like this guy. I want to get in touch with them. What's the best way to engage with you? Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram. That's Instagram.com forward slash Chandler underscore SAF or YouTube, YouTube.com forward slash Chandler Walker SAF. If you want to learn more about our Compassion Conversation sales program, you can go to nine step.cultureofcare.life and I'll give you our entire nine step framework. So basically what to do every step along the way. I tend to give everything away for free because then people come to me because they need help for coaching anyway. So that's nine step.cultureofcare.life, the number nine. Oh, yep. That was what I was going to ask. So I'm, I'm making a note here. So if you want to follow him on Instagram, it's Chandler underscore SAF as in stone age fuel. That's right. right. And then uh, nine step, the number nine dot culture of care dot life. Reach out to him through there. And uh, his name is Chandler Walker. Chandler, I'm, I'm really grateful that you've been on the show today. I'm going to give you the last word. So is there anything else you want to share today before we sign off? Yeah. Last word for me is just put one foot in front of the other. Sometimes if we think too far ahead, we get overwhelmed and it becomes too challenging to think about obtaining those goals. And I had a good mentor a long time ago who said, okay, here, you have your big brass ring. And that might seem pretty hard to get to. That might seem like, wow, a hundred million dollar business. Wow. Whatever. So let's create little micro rings. Let's create small little rungs that you're going to climb up every step of the way. So you, you set up these micro wins. So it gives you the audacity to be excited about hitting the big win long-term. Love it, Chandler. Well, man, honor talking to you. Best of luck on everything you've got going on. Uh, take care of Aubriana. I said her name right, right? You did. You got uh, it. Nailed yeah. It. So take care of her. Spend time with her. That is success to you. Thank you for being here. And, and congratulations on all your success. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Hopefully everybody got some value out of this episode and they enjoyed it. Well, there you have it. Another very successful entrepreneur about his journey to success. And I really like Chandler's definition of success. He talked about how that he wants to spend obscene amounts of time with his daughter. And I didn't ask the follow-up question that I normally do. If you're a regular listener, you know, I normally ask what's your definition of success. And then I say, well, by that definition, do you consider yourself successful? But based on the way he answered it, he absolutely is a successful person and considers himself such because 
he does spend all that time. He goes to the recitals with his happy pills, <laughs> the, the little lollipops, and he's he's pouring time into his three year old daughter, Aubriana. And and in that isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want as entrepreneurs? Don't we want to break free? from the grind of running the daily business show, being involved in everything. And he said it himself. He said, I realized early in that first year that I didn't want to run and do the grind of running daily operations. I wanted to establish systems and processes so that I could go live the life that I want to live. So that doesn't mean that he kind of walked away and left everything to fend for itself. He still meets with his leaders. He still does things on a regular basis, but he has freedom. Isn't that what you want? Well, if you want that, I want to invite you to the Business Accelerator. That group coaching cohort, it's a live group coaching cohort that I run. It's an eight session program, eight hours of live coaching with me with the express purpose of helping you live the life that Chandler talked about. It's living the life of exit without exiting. How do you get out of the daily ground so that if you have a three-year-old daughter, you can go spend time with her at a recitals. If you have a teenager that you can help show them how to drive and you can go work with them on college applications and you can go do college visits and you're not worried about what's happening back at the office. Isn't that what you want? If it is what you want, go to exitwithoutexiting.com. Sign up, apply for a conversation with me to show you what it's like to get into that course, to invest the money and the time so that you can get that life of freedom. Just like we talked about on the show today, you should invest a renewable resource like money to get non-renewable resources like time. So invest the money to enroll in this course, the Business Accelerator at Exit Without Exiting, so that you can get all of the time back that you really really wanted. Tune in again next week when we talk with yet another very successful entrepreneur about his or her journey to success. Until then, I'm the real Jason Duncan and Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.